Lord, we're connected to you again when it comes to looking at the Christmas story of Jesus Christ. And again, I'm just wanting to emphasize it's not only a story, but it's a fact-based truth about the life of Jesus Christ and especially the birth of Jesus Christ. And so we're glad that we can join you today. Uh, we're moving along in our testimonials, our factual live testimonials of the, the people that were around the time of Christ. And uh, we are looking at today the man named Joseph. And so I pray that you will grab some insights and that they will help you to have a greater understanding of the testimonials, of live testimonials concerning the life, <laughs> the true life, <laughs> Of, in the true way of Jesus Christ. This is so important. It's not a story off in the middle of nowhere and it has a nice little ending to it, but uh, it has, um, I guess you could say, a great foundational truth uh, to the believer. And so as we look at the, the testimony of Joseph, we're going to see that right at the very beginning, the name Joseph means... Well, in Hebrew, it's Yosef, which means he shall add or God shall add. And that's kind of an unusual name that God was going to add. And the reason we can see this idea of adding, because if we look at the genealogy of Joseph, we can see that he is part of the genealogy of David, King David. And that was an eternal genealogy. And now here God is going to add to Joseph uh, a blessing of being part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So when we start off, most of the talking about uh, Matt or Joseph is found in the book of Matthew. And so we will be in and out of the book of Matthew. And we're going to see that in the opening account Concerning Joseph and his life, we see that Joseph was a just man. That he lived upright before the Lord. He wanted to do things that were right. He was probably a very law-abiding citizen. And he knew the Hebrew scriptures, most likely from childhood, when he was going to a, probably a form of bar mitzvah back then. And uh, we see that Joseph was engaged to marry. Now, as we talked about yesterday, engagement was a lot more binding than it is today uh, in our society. Let's look in uh, Matthew chapter 1 as we begin to see what was taking place here. Because in verse 18 it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as followed. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. And it goes on and says, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, and we will look at that in a moment. But here we have Joseph, who was a just man, who was engaged to marry. The, the families had already put together the engagement party, already got together and say, okay, these two couples, these two people will be married because uh, Mary's parents would have to approve of Mary's uh, marriage to Joseph, and Joseph's family would have approved uh, their union. And this would have been set forth. And I know that's so unusual for our thinking today because as couples, we think, well, once we hit the age of 18, we can pick and choose whoever we want, and it doesn't matter whether our family likes it or not. <laughs> but I had to go through that personally over in Myanmar to have the family uh, together. And it was interesting that when even when the marriage comes on the marriage certificate in over there in Myanmar, especially amongst the Kachin people, uh, not only do you have the pastor being a witness and signing the marriage certificate, 
or and the couples, uh, the the now man and woman who were going to be married, signing the certificate, and then their witnesses signing the certificate. But there was also a spot on there where a member of uh, the family, a representative of the family on both sides, would have also signed the marriage certificate. And so what was about to take place, you know, Joseph has now gone through all this. Is they're probably going to set the date and Joseph would be getting his house in order, ready to go and receive his bride. Isn't it interesting? That's the same picture that we have of Jesus. He's gone into heaven. You know, he's interceding on behalf of us, getting everything in order so that when he comes back for his bride, and here Joseph would have been doing the same thing. But now there was going to be some life-changing events that were going to happen to Joseph. Because all of a sudden, you know, he realizes that his future wife is already pregnant, is already with child. So Joseph is engaged to Mary, and then just as he's pondering this and discovering that, wow, you know, Mary had said to him, I, I got to tell you something, Joseph, and you're not, and you're not going to believe this. <laughs> you're going to find it hard to believe it, but I'm already pregnant. And Joseph's heart would have just sunk and just said, oh, you know, she's been fooling around on the side or whatever. She hasn't been faithful. She hasn't been true. And then he, then Mary comes to her and says, well, Joseph, it's not that way at all. I've been impregnated by the power of God, of the Holy Spirit. And the child that is in me is a, the child, the Son of God. Can you imagine what this conversation would have been like? I don't know about you how we would handle it. But then as he's pondering about it and thinking, okay, I'm not going to marry somebody who is already pregnant. And he's thinking about it. And next thing you know, we have an angel that shows up. And he now, in a dream, is going to meet uh, an angel. And the angel is going to speak on behalf of God a very clear message to Joseph. And we see here that Joseph is going to be greeted. He says here in verse 19 of chapter 1, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, we've read this already, but then verse 20, But while he thought about this thing, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, and notice what he says, Joseph, the son of David. He already connects them to the genealogy of David. This was so important because what was in Mary was the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And Joseph was going to be uh, the father who would raise that child the child of the Son of God, who is now going to be the Son of Man. And he says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you, to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is the Holy Spirit. Now it's interesting, just a few minutes before, we see that uh, when we're talking about the story here of, of Joseph being met by an angel, just a few minutes before, Mary is telling Joseph, hey, uh, I've been impregnated by the Holy Spirit. And now the angel shows up and says, okay, Joseph, you don't want to believe Mary? I'm going to tell you from God, this is what's happening. And he says to him, you know, you are the son of David. You are of the line of King David. You have this genealogy. You have this heritage that goes on for hundreds of years. And Joseph, don't be afraid now. Don't be afraid. And what was going to be the fear? What was going to be the fear of what other people may have said? How often we fear people more than we fear God. So Joseph was thinking, well, I can't get married because I'm going to be a, you know, uh, made a fool of in my community and that. And God says, you know, Joseph, don't have fear. Don't have fear of what is going to take place. I am with you. You're of the tribe of Judah. You're of the line of King David. I am with you. And this is what I want you to do. And so he goes on. And he says to Mary, your wife, for which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So the second time we have the Holy Spirit uh, referenced to. And then he goes on. And she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. And so, and with this encounter, 
he says, Mary, you know, he's going to tell Mary or tell Joseph, you're going to marry. I, you know, don't be afraid. Mary, Mary. <laughs> and this is what I want to instruct you on. And so the angel shared with Joseph several essential facts. He says, first of all, Mary is with child and the child is conceived by the Holy Spirit. That's a fact. And he needed to grab that, even though he may not understand the power of the Holy Spirit. He probably knew a little bit about the Spirit of God that would come upon men. He probably heard the accounts in the times of old where the Spirit of God would come upon like Samson and others and, and the prophets and that and would speak through them and would do miraculous things through them, the Spirit of God. So he would know a little bit about that. And now he is told that the Spirit of God has come upon Mary and she has conceived. Secondly, the, spirit, the, the angel says, and when this child is born, you know, Joseph, you're to call him Jesus. For he would save his people from their sins. Again, just like Zacharias, instead of carrying the name Joseph the second or some other biblical name, he was to call him Jesus, which in Hebrew would have been Joshua, which also means salvation of the Lord. And and salvation is from the Lord. And so he would have been just okay, you know. I mean he's listening. He he's in a in a dream listening to this. And the third thing that the, the he says, this child would be the fulfillment of the prophet spoken. You know, what did the spot prophet speak? Well, we know in Isaiah that he proclaimed that Jesus would be the Emmanuel, the God with us, Isaiah 7, 14. And after hearing all this instructions, he believed and obeyed and took Mary as his wife. Look what it says as he goes on here. He says, he will save the people from their sins. And all this was done that it might be fulfilled. So, see, the things that were going on in Elizabeth, the things that were going on in Zacharias, the things that were going on in Mary, now the things that are going on in, in uh, Joseph and in the, the conceived child of Jesus within Mary's womb was a fulfillment of Scripture. Everything was going to be fulfilled. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy, but I came to fulfill. And uh, so... All this is done that it may be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophets, spoken by Jehovah God, the Lord, through the prophets, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So something very unique was taking place because not only was God going to be with them, around them, and that when the child would be born, born forth, it would, it would his name, one of his names would be Emmanuel, but his other name it would be Jesus. God is salvation. And what was going to happen? That the the salvation of the Lord wasn't going to be like in the times of Joshua or or Samson, where he he saved them from their enemies outwardly. The salvation of the Lord was now going to take place inwardly, and that was what was going to be excited exciting then in verse 24 then joseph being aroused aroused from his sleep and did as the angel of the lord commanded him and took him his wife and it goes on and makes this little little statement here and he did not know her till she uh, she had brought forth her firstborn son and they called his name jesus so here at the very beginning he knows his wife's pregnant by the Holy Spirit. He now has an angel saying to him, Obey the Holy Spirit. This is what's happening. You're gonna, he's going to be fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah that he would be God with us. And uh, you need to, to take her as your wife. But don't have any physical relationships with her until after the child is born. Can you imagine that? All this instructions. And, and, you know, what we can learn from the instructions is, instruction is that Joseph is faithful to what God has said. You know, he didn't say, well, maybe so, maybe not, you know, yeah, okay, I will do the marriage part and kind of not shame her, but I'm not going to do all the rest of this stuff. I'm not going to name him Jesus and I'm not going to, 
stay away from Mary. I mean, she's beside me every night. How am I going to do that? But the power of God was going to be upon that home. And the power of God was going to give Mary the strength and was going to give Joseph the strength to fulfill the words of God and to be able to do that. And then, of course, what happens next? All of a sudden, uh, you know, he works his way all through. And then a decree comes from Rome saying, you got to go back to your hometown. you got to go back to your heritage. You know, sometimes we struggle with, uh, you know, the laws of the land and that. But here the laws of the land said, you know, Joseph, you need to go back to where your heritage is and you're born and you need to fill out the census and let us know who you are, who you're married to, and what kind of children you have. And again, he was obedient to the laws of the land. And he went back and, uh, you know, began to take Mary back. Here she's she's heavily endued with uh, uh, the child-to-be, and that he was going to go back to Bethlehem, which is the city of kings, but it's also the city of David, but it's also known as the city of bread, where Jesus would be able to say down the road, I am the bread of life. Can you see all the things connecting together here? You know, and most likely he didn't realize that he was going to be fulfilling the prophecy of Malachi 5.2, that the Son of God was to be born in Bethlehem. I'm sure Joseph didn't have, you know, a scholarly education where he memorized all the prophets and all the things that they said. But here he said, okay, I'm willing to get married. I'm willing not to have any relationship. I'm willing to believe that the child in her is filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm willing to believe that i got to go down to Bethlehem because this is part of God's will. They're showing that, that Christ is fulfilling all prophecy. Can you imagine that? <laughs> you know, the faithfulness of Joseph. And then Joseph gets down to, we see, to Bethlehem. And we realize that, you know, he didn't go on and book an Airbnb. He didn't go and t- to the website and try to find himself a hotel he probably didn't realize that a whole bunch of the country was moving around and had to get to their hometowns and their home villages to do the census. And so he gets to the hometown. He goes to the inn. He he would know uh, probably about his hometown because that's where he was, you know, uh, probably grew up in that, where he was born. And so he gets back there and there is no room in the inn. No place to sleep. I'm thinking Joseph saying, I'm so tired. You know, I'm just being obedient, Lord. Can't you just work it out that maybe there's a place that we can sleep? You know, I don't know about you. Some of us have the gift of complaining. And uh, a lot of times we like to complain about the way things are. I mean, Joseph, he, he could have had all the complaining that he wanted to and just be saying, God, I'm trying to be faithful. At least do this little thing and and give me a place to sleep in an inn at least. And, and the innkeeper says, there's not a place. Everything is full. We're full to the rafters. But if you want to, you know, see that barn over there or that cave over there, whatever it may be. Some feel it's a barn. Some feel it was a cave, you know, where the animals were kept at night. And there would have been a door across the front to keep them safe. You can go sleep there tonight. Well, again, you know, uh, the combinations weren't the way he liked it. But he didn't realize that he, again, was fulfilling the scriptures. That in the fullness of time, that with there was no room in the end, that he would be rested and he would have to go to a stable and that night Jesus would be born. So, you know, I'm sure he's just exhausted. And they just get into probably the stable, you know, with all the animals. He probably just made a little bit of bed in the straw. And Mary just turns to Joseph and says, Joseph, I got to tell you something. What? My water just broke. What? The baby's coming. Now, here, in the stable? Yeah, it's coming. And uh, get ready. <laughs> so, you know, okay, like, we don't talk a lot about Joseph, but, you know, we got to realize that Joseph is a man of faith. I mean, he's just stepping along in the steps of God and say, okay, God, and now I'm going to be a midwife or whatever. I'm sure there was a servant lady that came along with Mary, and, and there was others that were to help there. 
But Joseph, you know, probably, you know, he might have ended up being the midwife. You know what I mean? To bring forth the child. And here, you know, uh, the child is now born. They wrap it in clean linen and everything and, and, and put the baby possibly in some type of manger, which would be, you know, it could even be just a food trough. Put some straw in the food trough and lay the baby in the manger because, you know, Mary, you know, is just bore a child. She's going to be wiped out probably from from the, uh, uh, you know, giving birth to a child. And uh, now they're going to have to clean everything all up. And, you know, this was now a maternity ward. <laughs> I mean, just think about all what's going on. We don't think about this. We just think about, oh, you know, they walked down and went on a little, you know, donkey. They got to Bethlehem. And yes, there was no inn. And yes, that this this is what was happening. And and so forth and so forth. I mean, the, everything about Jesus Yes, he was the son of God, but he was going to be born as a son of man. You know, he was going to be conceived, yes, by the Holy Spirit, but he was going to have to grow in the womb for nine months. He was going to have to come out the birth channel. He was going to have to, you know, have um, pains, <laughs> go through pain and suffering to be born for, birth for, you know, everything. And they were going to be in this manger, you know. And then, so now they finally laid down. And and next thing that happens with Joseph, a whole bunch of shepherds show up. You know, it's the middle of the night. Come on, guys, it's the middle of the night. How come you're not sleeping? And the Bible tells us that that now Joseph is going to meet a bunch of shepherds. And the exact event was proclaimed. And an, and the interesting thing, not only does you know uh, Mary meet an angel, Joseph meets an angel. But the angel shows up with the shepherd, not only one angel, but a whole host of angels that brought the whole entire choir with them. I mean, I, I just love these, this, this account of what's going on. And, and I'm, I'm always trying to think about what would I be going through if I was in the midst of that? And the angel spoke to the shepherds who were, we are told, watching their flock by night in Luke 2, 11 to 12 and says this, for there is born to you this day. This day something mighty has happened. And it's been and to you a child has been born this day in the city of David. They needed to be in Bethlehem, in the city of David. A savior, one who would bring salvation, who is the Christ. So not only is he they, they've changed his name, they don't just say uh, the city of David a uh, Jesus. They say the city of David, a Savior, who is the Christ. Who is the Christ? The Messiah, the Anointed One. They're coming down. These shepherds have got a word, and they're coming to Mary and Joseph and whoever's there and said, yeah, you just named him Jesus, but let me tell you what the angel told us about him. That this little child right here is the Messiah, the Anointed of God who was going to be the deliverer and redeemer of this world. Wow. I, I'm sure, you know, Joseph was wondering, okay, what's going on here? But then after a few days, we see Joseph, and I'm telling you the testimony of Joseph, because, you know, we, we have on our first point that, you know, how Joseph was engaged, and then how Joseph encountered an angel, and then how Joseph had to take a trip to Bethlehem. And then how Joseph struggled with the accommodations. And then how Joseph, uh, you know, meets the shepherd. And the next thing that comes along with all this had to happen within the seven or eight days, he now had to go to Jerusalem. You know, it was one thing to fulfill the census and probably say, okay, let's go home. But now... Because the child that was born was a son, there was laws and regulations and rules about all that. And that son, the firstborn, the one who opens the womb, the firstborn was going to have to be taken to the temple in Jerusalem. A sacrifice would have had to be bought and paid for. Then circumcision would have had to been done. And then at the end of the circumcision, there would be the time of naming. And this child shall be named Jesus. So, again, he was following in, the, in, in what Jesus uh, what, uh, would be required to be done to his son. But he was following Jesus. And Jesus, 
uh, was to be dedicated, was to be circumcised in the temple. And that's when we meet Anna and Simeon, who we're going to talk about down the road. And so, okay, you know, he is going to meet them and everything, and, and he's going to fulfill the law, and and now he's he's happy, okay? Whew, got it all done. I got the, the son is born, <laughs> the son is dedicated, and then rumors start to go around concerning King Herod. And we see in Matthew 2, 16 to 23, that King Herod, you know, he then begins to hear from the Magi. Some believe it's a couple of years later. Whatever time factor you want to put with it, it most likely was a time later. But now he hears about Herod, his hatred for this new king and that he had heard was coming. And due to Herod's persecution, following the birth of Jesus, God spoke to, to Joseph again in a dream. It seems like three or four times Joseph has dreams and God speaks to him, warning him to flee to Egypt with his wife, Mary, and with Jesus. And we see that in Matthew 2.13. So, can you, can, I don't know where all the money came from. You know, that's what we would be thinking about, okay? Where is all the money coming from? You know what I mean? Like, we just, we'd gone down to do the census. Now we just had a trip to, to, uh, to Jerusalem, and shortly we're going to go on a trip to Egypt, where he's probably never been before, but flee to Egypt, because God warns him in the dream, and, and Joseph is faithful and says, okay, let's go back, let's go down to Egypt. So they go down to Egypt, and we know in Matthew two nineteen to 23, that after a period of time, Herod died, and God then speaks to Joseph again in a dream, and says, you know, it's safe, Herod's gone, and the one who was going to persecute the child is gone. And so it's okay to go back. But that as he was beginning to go back, he has another dream. And and this time in the dream, he's the Lord speaks to him, I, I want you to go back. But I don't want you to go back to Bethlehem. I don't want you to go back to Jerusalem. But where I want you to go back is to Nazareth. So he was going to come, Jesus was going to come out of Egypt, out of the bondage of Egypt, out of the bondage of this world. You know, we always talk about how the people needed to get out of Egypt, but they still needed to get Egypt out of them to come out of that bondage. And so here, as a fulfillment of prophecy, Jesus himself was going to come out of Egypt and he was going to go uh, to uh not to Galilee or other towns or villages, but to Nazareth. And because, again, Joseph was a man of faith, he was obedient to the voice of God. And they head off to Nazareth. And it's interesting when we read this section here, that Joseph and Nazareth, we read that, that uh, uh, again, part of the prophecy would be is that Jesus would also become known as a Nazarene. And uh, that idea of a Nazarene, if you would go over, somebody, some of you may already have caught on to it, but who was another Nazarene? Well, we may not have remembered, but there is a great man in the book of Judges, and uh, whose name is Samson. And let me just turn that, uh, that passage of scripture, Samson, or Judges chapter 13, verse 5. We're going to read here. Let me just get to it. Judges 13, 5, where it talks about this whole idea of being a Nazarene or a Nazarite. At 13, 5, it says, For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, and the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. You know, yes, this is talking about Samson. But is it a prophetic word that now is going to talk about Jesus Christ? He would be a Nazarite. And as a Nazarite, he would be set apart. And the purpose of his birth was to deliver the people of Israel. I don't know about you, but it's an amazing thought. Well... We learn a little bit also that I th I wanted to tie it in here because we learn 
that also in the times that Joseph had other family members later, and some of you may not realize this, but Jesus had half brothers and half sisters. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think we need to talk about that and just say, you know, that Joseph and Mary, we see in the book of Matthew and the book of Mark, it tells us that there were four brothers, James, uh, Joseph, Simon, and Jude, and one unnamed sister found in Matthew chapter, well, Matthew chapter 13, 55 to 56, and Mark chapter 6. And so, you know, after the birth of Jesus Christ, Mary and Joseph continued on. I mean, we don't know how long Joseph lived, but Joseph was a testimony. And one of the things that I've added in here uh, onto this teaching today is to realize that there was some critical characteristics of Joseph. You know, Joseph, I, I think sometimes we forget, was very, very faithful to the words of God. And God used him. I think all men and women, we need to be understanding that when God speaks, or when God speaks to us through his word, we need to be faithful. Faithful, faithful, faithful. Secondly, we see from Joseph that he resisted temptation. Can you see the journey that he had to go through? That's why I laid it all out, because this is the testimony of Joseph alongside the testimony of Jesus Christ, alongside the testimony of Mary. And, he, you know, there must have been a lot of temptations, you know, to give his wife away, to, to lay her aside. You know, not to go down to Bethlehem. I mean, I'm not going to obey that rule, and I'm just going to stay home. And then to say, I'm not going to, you know, uh, go to Jerusalem and do that circumcision thing and obey the law. I'm not going to run down to Egypt, and, you know, and I'm not going to fulfill the will of God there. I'm not going to go back to Nazareth. It's amazing how many times people said, or how many people say often, I, you know, they pick and choose what they will do concerning the will of God. But Joseph didn't. He was resisted temptation and he carried out the sovereignty of God in his life, the will of God. He was self-disciplined when it came to the will of God. And I think it's important that as God spoke to him, that God ministered to him and, and, and called him to do Many things that he would normally not be able to do in his strength, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, through his understanding of God, through the dreams and visions that God gave him, he was able to be empowered. And that's where we want to conclude with today that Joseph, I believe, was empowered. And he was empowered in such a way that he could fulfill the will of God, trusting what he was called to do. He was called to be, you know, the father, uh, the adopted father, however you want to call it, to the Son of God. He was called to be the husband to Mary. He was called to, to, to take that child and keep that child safe in its younger years, to lay down his life, to do what needed to be done to preserve the child. He was faithful, you know, in what he did. And he was consistent, and God rewarded him by being with him and directing him. And so we should make sure that we pay attention, as I put in this empowerment, that empowerment comes by fulfilling the will of God and trusting what, call, what God has called us to do. Then, we should make sure we pay attention to the details of his words, to the things that he has spoken to us. And I end up by saying empowerment comes by following the voice of our great shepherd, Jesus Christ, being willing to hear, to do, and to commit to where he leads and that we will pursue with all our hearts to follow. Amen. So I hope that you've been encouraged today that as we looked at this live testimonial of Joseph and how he fits in during what we call the Christmas season and how he was instrumental just like Zacharias, just like 
Elizabeth, just like Mary. He was instrumental in the plan of God for God to be able to carry out the fullness of what he had in mind through the Son of Man to the lost world who needed redemption and salvation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to have this real-life testimony of Joseph. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you were able to encourage him, to empower him, to give him the faith to believe, O oh God, that you could use him and work through him, that you gave him characteristics, O oh God, that were important, Lord, that he would not uh, fall to temptation, but he would remain faithful, that he would remain disciplined and be consistent in walking with you. And Lord, I just thank you how your sovereignty was upon his life. And so, Lord, we just thank you for the truths that we can learn during this Christmas season about these wonderful fact-based testimonies of the people you put around yourself during this Christmas season, this, this birthing forth time. And, Lord, I pray that you would birth forth these truths into our lives now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Just remind you, continue to pray as this booklet Jesus Christ in the fullness of time is going into thousands and thousands of homes, not only here in Canada, but in other parts of the world, and that God would use it for his glory. God bless you, and Lord willing, we hope to see you tomorrow. And if you happen to be nearby the mall, Clear Springs Center, come on in and see us. We'd love to give you a big hug in the name of Jesus. Bye-bye for now.